staying here when, when we're done with the, the reason we're all here, mainly. Okay. Um, uh, we are really thrilled that Medea Benjamin is with us. Uh, if you're at all involved or, or remotely interested in peace and justice work in this country, then one assumes you've heard about Code Pink. And Medea is one of the founders of Code Pink. Um, and I know I always get a huge kick when I turn on uh, 35 or 36 on the television to watch the hearings in the House of the Senate. And there they are. Looking just past the guys at the table is some woman who's kind of like doing this. <laughs> has her hat, sneaking up the sign, and uh, it's just terrific. Um, yes. Uh, if you haven't seen this book, which is out on the table, this book is uh, recently published by Medea, um, and I encourage it. It's a forward by Barbara Ehrenreich, and those of you may know that Ron Ehrenreich, our local Red Evening guy, is Barbara's cousin, so we're kind of connected. Um, but this is a way to support the movement and to do some good learning, so buy it and share it. And... Okay, um, Medea, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Well, let me say, oh, is this too loud? No? Okay. What a great inspiration it is to be among you and to walk into that room when you're planning your actions for tomorrow. It's just so uplifting for me to see. And let me just see a show of hands. How many of you are participating in one way or the other in the actions tomorrow? And how many of you are risking arrest? Can we give an applause for those? really the center place, this and the, the folks around Creech for the resistance to drones. And I know by starting to go around the country and talk to people about drones, that they are so inspired about what you're doing here. And after tomorrow, they will be even more inspired. So thank you so much. And I am going to focus on war, but I thought I'd start out with a, um, another example of outrageous resistance because, uh, <laughs> you know, we are all part of the 99% and part of this Occupy movement. And one of the issues of the Occupy movement has been the terrible control that the banks have uh, on our financial system and the need to break up the banks. And in code pink vernacular, that translates to bust up the banks. And um, some of us are not all that well endowed when it comes to busting up the banks. But um, <laughs> others in code pink are. And we each have to do our part. So um, we had a, a demonstration in, in New York City just a couple of weeks ago where the CEO, Brian Moynihan, of Bank of America was speaking at an event. And it was a uh, just about an all-male event. It was for the financial world. And it was uh, you had to pay a lot of money to get in the event. And uh, we thought, as we usually do, let's try to get in. What the hell? You know, they say no, or you get in, or whatever, but you'll never get in unless you try. So um, we just dressed up in a, in a suit, take off the pink when you're trying to get into a place like that. Uh, and uh, two of us, my younger colleague uh, and I, just walked in, sat down, and there we were. And we thought, OK, cool, now what? So um, we uh, had planned, in case we got in, a little, little action. And um, Brian Moynihan got up to speak. Well, we had somebody in with us who was going to take video. They would not let anybody in there with video. There were no cameras, no video. You know, when these guys meet now, they're like ashamed of themselves. It's, you know, they've got a bad name now. So they don't want pictures. They don't want any uh, trail. So we were kind of upset that we didn't have our wonderful videographer anymore. But we said, you know, what the hell? Here we are. So he gets up to speak. I walk up right onto the stage, 
And my colleague walks on next to the stage. There's a table. She gets on the table next to the stage. <laughs> we take off our jackets. We take off our shirts. We have our pink bras on, and we wrote "Bust Up the Banks" on our chest. <laughs> And we did our whole, we did a mic check, we did a bust up the banks, you know, we got we got hauled out of there. But you should have seen the face of this Brian Moynihan when he looks around and he sees these women in their bras. <laughs> <laughs> but because there were no pictures, we were really disappointed, you know, when we opened, we, we looked at the uh, Wall Street Journal the next day, they had a picture of this very serious looking Moynihan and a pink bra floating in the background. <laughs> story about how these women, women got in and uh, tried to bust up the banks. So um, we are really excited to be part of this Occupy movement, to see that now there is a new generation of people who are involved and active and creative, and we learn so much from that generation. I think you know we've gotten stale a lot of times in the way we've been organizing over the years, and when we've looked around and there are no young people with us, you know, it was time to kind of like wonder what are we doing wrong. And I think now uh, so many of us feel a new level of inspiration uh, because there are so many exciting, creative things that are happening. And in fact, I just opened up my email this morning and saw this list of uh, gatherings that are going to happen in the shareholder meetings starting in May, because this is the season for the shareholder meetings. And to see the uh, Bank of America, I'm going, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, it's going to be really fun. We got a bus from Washington, D.C., where I'm living, that's going to take a 100 people down. Um, there's a, a lot of mobilizing for the Wells Fargo shareholder meeting, for uh, a lot of the different corporations uh, that are having their shareholder meetings. It's going to be a very lively spring and a really lively summer. And Joe talked to us about, uh, about NATO and how exciting that's going to be. Um, and then we have the conventions. And I think the conventions are going to be a fabulous time to be getting out there saying, we are standing outside the political party system. Our message goes beyond political parties, and it's the same message whether we're talking to Democrats or Republicans. And I hope that many of us will be out there uh, with, with our message uh, that includes the, uh, the need to end these wars. And speaking of war, I know that some of you who were here earlier had a chance to talk to the Afghan youth and how inspiring it is to uh, hear from them. But my colleague uh, Jody Evans of, of Code Pink has been in uh, Turkey where there's a, an international meeting of women. And she said it has been so heartbreaking to talk to the Afghans and the Iraqis and that they feel just so devastated. Starting with the Iraqis, I mean, I went to Iraq before Saddam Hussein was kicked out and then after, year after year, and each time I went, I saw that the women that we had been working with, uh, women who were highly educated, I mean, there was such a stereotypical view of, of Iraq until you landed on the ground and you realized that uh, women were so involved in their societies and they were architects and engineers and doctors and uh, to see year by year after the U.S. invasion, uh, so many of them killed or refugees or internally displaced, anybody who had money leaving if they could. Uh, and it is heartbreaking. And they also were telling uh, us now about the levels of cancer that have skyrocketed with all of the depleted uranium and all of the terrible weapons that the U.S. has been using there. And what really breaks my heart is no sense of accountability in this country at all. I mean, that is one of the things that Coping and others still keep trying to do every time there's a George Bush or a, a Donald Rumsfeld or Condoleezza Rice or any of them come to somewhere where we know they're coming. We try to get in, we try to get up on the stage, and we try to bring our little pink fluffy handcuffs and say, in the name of the people, we want to arrest you for being war criminals. Um, but what does it say about our country that we have not done that? In the case of 
Afghanistan, now it's 10 years and counting, and with the billions and billions and billions of dollars that we have poured into that country, it is still one of the most impoverished places in the world. And then we have the drain to, to our financial system with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan being very much a part of why our economy is the way it is today, trillions of dollars. I heard a talk recently by um, one of the uh, people, Joseph Stieglitz and Linda Bills, who have written the book, The Three Trillion Dollar Wars. You know, they said the peak cost for, uh, for health care for Vietnam um, was 2010. Vietnam War, the peak cost 2010. So the costs we are going to see for generations to come as the veterans get older and older and sicker and sicker and our society pays for that. Um, it is the younger generation, those of you who are uh, under 30 in this room, you're going to be paying for these wars for decades and decades to come. One of the positive things we're seeing now in the case of Afghanistan is even though Barack Obama came and said Iraq bad war, Afghanistan good war, the American people no longer think that is a good war. And in fact, the polls that were taken in April showed the uh, highest level of discontent ever about the wars in Afghanistan, showing seven out of ten people saying that they are opposed to the war and also saying that the wars in war in Afghanistan is not worth fighting. Now that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Because once you're in the middle of the war, you know, it's always, you got to uh, keep a positive face on it and support the soldiers to say it's not worth fighting. And what's really, really remarkable is that for the first time ever, it included a majority of Republicans. So that is very, very important. You'd think somebody like Mitt Romney might want to take notice of that and stop saying to Barack Obama, you shouldn't have a timeline to bring the troops home by 2014. Um, uh, but it doesn't seem like that has sunk in yet, but that's not a real popular position with the American public. So, but we have a real paradox right now because we have this overwhelming majority of people saying, let's get the hell out of Afghanistan. And on the other hand, you have polls that came out recently looking at U.S. support for drones. And guess what? It's higher, the support for drones, than the opposition to the war in Afghanistan. It's eight out of 10 Americans saying it's just fine to use drones to kill terrorist suspects. Suspects. You don't know if they're real terrorists, but you suspect that they're terrorists, and it is fine to kill them. Eight out of ten Americans saying that. And of that eight out of ten Americans, 79% of them said it was okay to kill Americans in drone attacks. And what is even sadder about all of that is that it includes not only a majority of Democrats, but a majority of people who define themselves as liberal Democrats. So that means that the work you're doing here is so absolutely critical because we have to start on that level of explaining to people why killing with drones is really not a good thing. And of course, for us, I think, in this room, the basic issue is the issue of morality. A basic issue is the issue of the ethics of using remote controlled killing, of having pilots that are based thousands and thousands of miles away sitting comfortably in their uh, uh, Air Force base, in whether it's a Hancock base or whether it's in Creech. Um, and I say comfortably because I don't know if you've seen recently, they, they uh, did a study and they showed that these pilots were not very comfortable and that they had to get a more ergonomically appropriate chairs for them. Um, while they are piloting these drones thousands and thousands of miles away um, that are killing people who, uh, most of the time, they have no idea who they are. And remember that um, the huge proliferation of drones came post 9-11. 
They were being developed beforehand, used in one variety or another, even in the days of Vietnam. But it was really 9-11 that led to this massive explosion in, of, of drones, going from about 50 drones being used in the year 2000 to now over 7,000 drones just in the hands of the military alone, not counting what the CIA has. Uh, and this explosion of drones is really part of um, fits into that narrative that I talked about when looking at the polls because the American people don't like American soldiers being killed. And the US government realized that if we are going to continue on our wars and continue with this empire that wants to decide the fate of the world and wants to make the world safe for our corporations, then we're going to have to fight wars in a different way. And that means let's take the boots off the ground. Maybe we'll have some special forces in there like they're talking about now uh, when the majority of troops are leaving Afghanistan. But drones is like the miracle. Drones for them is the way out because they can make war without the American public even knowing about it. And that's what's happening today. I mean, look at Pakistan. We are not supposed to be at war with Pakistan. We have a, a drone program in Pakistan that is not run by the US military. We're run by the military. We might know a little bit more about it. But it's run by the CIA, the secretive agency. And so when you ask somebody, if you can find somebody from the CIA, and they're hard to find, they don't really kind of identify themselves. But we do see them sometimes in the hearings. And we follow them after in the hearings. And we say, those drone programs are killing people. And they say, drone program? What drone program? I mean, they won't even admit that there is a drone program because it's a secretive program. And so how are we supposed to know how many people are being killed, how they determine their hit list, what happens uh, to the people who are killed by mistake? Uh, because they don't admit any of that. And yet, there are journalists and others who are trying to piece together this information. And remember, it's very hard because uh, foreign journalists are not allowed to even go to northern uh, Pakistan, where these drone strikes are being carried out. But trying to piece together the information, the best information that we have is that, over, uh, that there have been over 300 drone strikes in Pakistan alone from 2004 till today that over 3,000 people have been killed. Some of the statistics say about 800 of those are innocent civilians, of those about 175 of them are children. But there are other people who say that is wrong. The, if you look at how many people are killed, the majority of them are innocent people. Because how do you know who is a militant? Well, we have a friend who is a lawyer who has taken on the cases of drone victims. His name is Shazad Akbar. We're trying to bring him to a drone summit that we're putting on next weekend. Well, he used to be very friendly with the United States. In fact, he used to be a consultant for the Agency for International Development, had been to the US many times. They facilitated his visa for him. He was also uh, helping the FBI in the case of a, uh, a, a, a terrorist um, issue that involved uh, Pakistani diplomats. And um, he never had a problem coming to the United States. Well, a couple of years ago, he started looking into this issue of the drones and started realizing that there were all these innocent people being killed. And he, as a lawyer, ought to do something about it. And he became a lawyer for uh, many of the drone victims. Well, lo and behold, last year, he was invited by Columbia Law School to a symposium uh, to speak about this. And all of a sudden, uh, he couldn't get a visa. So we invited him to come to this drone summit, and he said, well, I can't get in because uh, I'm now persona non grata in the United States. And we said, well, let's try anyway. So he went and he solicited the visa, and he said, well, and they told him, well, actually, your application is still open from a year ago, so you don't have to apply again. So he said, OK, well, I want to go to the United States. And he said to us, you know, I'll never get in. They, they obviously they made it pretty clear that I'm not going to get in. So we started a campaign. 
And we got people writing and calling and contacting uh, Congress and the State Department and the embassy, uh, U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. Well, I'm keeping my fingers crossed and knocking on wood because we got a call from him on Friday and said he was called into the consular section of the U.S. Embassy. They want him to come in Monday morning because they have some news for him. So we think that they're going to let him into the U.S., which is a big victory. So his message is not one that the U.S. government wants to hear because his message is that the CIA and the U.S. government, they say everybody they killed is a militant. And you know how they know that it was a militant? Because they were killed, right? Oh. <laughs> And uh, he says that the American uh, government says that, that if you're walking around in North Waziristan with a gun, then you're probably a militant. And he says, well, everybody in that area walks around with a gun. Uh, and so he believes that most of the people who are being killed are, uh, are, are innocent. They might be sympathetic to the Taliban, but that does not give the U.S. the right to go in and kill them. And one of the reasons that people become sympathetic to the Taliban is precisely because of these drone strikes. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the drone strikes have been counterproductive. Let's face it, if a new piece of technology was going to allow the United States to win wars, we wouldn't still be fighting in Afghanistan right now. Uh, if a new piece of technology is going to allow us to wipe out al-Qaeda and, ta and the Taliban, we wouldn't still be doing drone strikes in, in, in Pakistan. Um, a new piece of technology is not going to change, uh, uh, change the situation. Um, it only perpetuates it. In fact, there was a RAND study that looked at 44 years uh, of uh, history at groups that were considered terrorist organizations, or terrorist groups, and, and looked at how they dissolved. And they said that 40% of them through some kind of negotiations, another 40% through policing, effective policing, and only 7% uh, through military force. Now that's not a leftist organization that did that study. Um, so the Pakistani government, you know, has kind of in the beginning said, uh, when we saw some of this through WikiLeaks, uh, said that, um, all right, you do the drone strikes and we'll pretend we're against them. We'll publicly say we don't like them. And they started out like that. And then they realized that actually they were against the drone strikes because the drone strikes were making the people very angry and they were blaming their own government. Why are you letting the United States come here and violate our sovereignty and kill people with impunity? They also recognized that it was only feeding into the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and that for everybody who was killed, then more people would get involved and, 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 and take up arms. So um, they started protesting for real. And they had uh, votes in the legislature in fact, the last one was a recent vote unanimously calling on the U.S. to stop the drone strikes. Now think about it. Here we go around the world. We send our bombs. We send our soldiers around the world because we're trying to bring democracy. And yet when a democratically elected government in Pakistan unanimously says, we don't want your drone strikes, the U.S. says, hmm, sorry. And it's not just now the prime minister. It's not just the legislature. All political parties got together and they all said this is a violation of sovereignty we don't want the drone strikes and the foreign minister even went to England recently and said please help us can't you, you use your pressure on the United States to tell them to stop the drone strikes their head of intelligence has said stop the drone strikes it's counterproductive and the people have come out in message is in huge numbers to say stop the drone strikes they've done their own sit-ins blocking U.S. bases, blocking NATO supplies going to Afghanistan. And most recently, there was a commission that came out with a report. Um, and the report said that um, drone attacks are counterproductive, cause loss of valuable lives and property, radicalize the local population, create support for terrorists, and fuel anti-American sentiment. This was an independent commission for the parliament. So 
drone strikes are not working. Do you think the Obama administration is getting that lesson? No. In fact, now there is a call, and this was in, in uh, uh, the paper this week in the Washington Post, I don't know if any of you caught it on Thursday, broader drone tactics sought. CIA aims to expand strikes in Yemen. Well, it turns out, you know, there's two kinds of strikes. One is called personality strikes. We have your name on a list. You, Vicki, you're on the list. We're going after you. Uh, <laughs> Beth, you're on the list. We're going after you. Okay, so they come up with their list. Who knows how they come up with them? They come up with their list. That's called a personality strike. Well, there's another kind of strike that's called a signature strike. And that kind of strike means we don't know your name, but we are looking for suspicious behavior. And when we see suspicious behavior, we want to have the right to attack you. Well, in Pakistan, the CIA has the right to do that. But so far in Yemen, they don't have that right. So they are soliciting now from the US government the right to do that. Now. Um, there are concerns. Already, the number of personality strikes has increased in Yemen. They say that um, the change would accelerate a campaign of US airstrikes in Yemen that is already on a record pace with at least eight attacks in the past four months. But there is a concern. The administration has placed tight limits, they call this tight limits, on the drone operations in Yemen so far to avoid being drawn into an often murky regional conflict and risk turning militants with local agendas into al-Qaeda recruits. So here, you know, they, they know that this is tremendous risk. They ought to just look back on uh, one of the drone strikes that took place in May of 2012 that I talk about in my book where they mistakenly killed a mediator. This was a mediator between the Yemeni government and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And this guy, who's a deputy governor, he was killed while conferring with an Al-Qaeda leader in an attempt to negotiate a settlement with the government. Well, the government felt terrible about that, and they apologized to his family for his death. But the killing prompted members of his tribe to strike at government facilities, including a military camp, an oil pipeline, and power lines. So guess what? People get very angry when their loved ones are killed. Now, there is a big debate going on in the government right now whether to allow for an expansion of the drone strikes in Yemen. So this is a very good time for us to weigh in on this issue. And I know that you here, um, who have been doing this work to stop the drone strikes, want to see an end to all drone strikes. But there is one particular area that I think we can have more influence on, and that's the drone strikes in the hands of the CIA. So I'm going to pass around this petition, because we're going to find people in the CIA and hand deliver these. And we want to, see, to say to the CIA that um, we don't want you being a paramilitary death squad carrying out assassinations in our name. Get the drones out of the hands of CIA. The drones in Yemen are being based not in Yemen but somewhere else. So who knows where that somewhere else is? Where? Yeah. Somalia? No, they got their own drones. That's a separate one. Yeah, where? Diego Garcia? No. Turkey? No, that's separate for dealing with the Kurds. Israel? They got their own drones. They use them, uh, unfortunately, quite regularly in the Gaza Strip. Iran? <laughs> Iraq? Uh, Iraq was very upset when they found out that we start taking troops out, but we wanted to leave our drones there. And so the drones are now based in Turkey, but we are actually working with the Turkish government that has its war on the Kurds. And so having our drones based there is putting us smack in the middle of a, another conflict between the Turks and the, and the Kurds. Um, it is, I think I heard somebody say it, which is Saudi Arabia. Um, that is particularly crazy because if you recall one of the reasons that Osama bin Laden uh, said that they attacked the United States on September 11th was precisely because we had US troops based in Saudi Arabia. 
Uh, of course, this is not known to the American public. They say a base in the Arabian Peninsula, but it is indeed Saudi Arabia. Um, there, are, somebody talked, uh, mentioned Somalia. The U.S. is using killer drones in Somalia. Um, uh, those drones are based in the African, tiny African nation of Djibouti. Uh, we do have drones, somebody mentioned Seychelles off the coast of East Africa. We also have drones in Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Ethiopia. We sent drones to Uganda and Burundi. Uh, and our friends in Australia were very, very surprised when they saw that the U.S. was not only sending military, but they were using the islands, uh, Australian I islands, the Cocos Islands, uh, for a base for U.S. drones. And they are very unhappy about that. So this is part of a massive proliferation of drones. And uh, an idea that the U.S. thinks that it can go anywhere, anytime, uh, no concern about nationality, no concern about geography, and kill people. And uh, it's not only just kill foreigners, it also includes killing U.S. citizens. Um, it was very interesting at a hearing the other day where the head of the FBI was there, and one of the questions was, uh, are you allowed to kill American citizens with drones here in the U.S.? And he said, um, I'm not sure I'll have to get back to you about that tonight. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is really very scary. So the U.S. is already using drones to kill Americans. And not only did they kill the, uh, the cleric on Moral Alaki, um, uh, and uh, two other Americans, but three, uh, two weeks after that, they killed son. his 16-year-old son, born in Denver. Um, the U.S. has since kind of admitted that killing the 16-year-old American who'd never been involved with anything was a mistake, but, um, you know, mistakes happen. And uh, what is amazing is how Eric Holder uh, was finally forced after years to say something about these drone strikes and try to justify this. And he did it before a group of um, college students, Northwestern University. I don't know how well they received his uh, explanation, but he said that we are in a war with an enemy that moves all around, and so we have to move all around. And in, in the case of U.S. citizens, the Constitution does not guarantee its citizens the right to judicial process, but only to do process. So I thought the best answer to that came not from other legal scholars, but actually from the uh, comedian Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and if you didn't see it, go Google it, because it's like priceless. He says, yes, the founders weren't picky. Trial by jury, trial by fire, rock, paper, scissors, who cares? <laughs> due process just means it's a process that you do. <laughs> and then he says, in this case, the president meets with his advisors, decides who to kill, and then he kills them. And if we're going to win our never-ending war against terror, there are bound to be casualties. And one of them just happens to be the Constitution. So, the, um, one of the ways I think we can talk about this to people who are not as convinced as we are um, is to say that uh, what if other countries did what we're doing? What kind of model are we putting forth? What kind of example are we putting forth? And uh, I think of the island nation of Cuba that for so many years has been trying to bring to justice a self-admitted terrorist, Luis Posada Carriles, who downed a Cuban commercial airline plane and uh, has, been, has never paid the, uh, for it, um, has been living in Miami a lovely life. In fact, I've been to his home. Uh, <laughs> um, we but I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I was very much uninvited. <laughs> but, you know, think about Cuba um, getting a drone and dropping it on a condo where a condominium where Luis Posada 
Carriles is living in uh, Miami and killing him and maybe some of the neighbors. Oops. Or what about the Chinese who have a lot of drones? I mean, talk about who produces drones. So the US is the number one producer. Somebody mentioned Israel, which is the number two producer and user of drones. And then the third largest producer is, is China. China has a lot of drones now. Well, they have people that they perceive as their enemies, including uh, a lot of the Uyghurs. And some of them are living here in the United States. So why shouldn't they come here and drop a drone on the, the flat in Brooklyn where some of these Uyghurs are living? And then spying, you know, the US, uh, uh, the, the Iranians scrambled, they say they scrambled one of our most sophisticated spy drones and put it on display for the world to see. And um, they also are producing their own drones. So Iran probably wants to know what's going on here in the United States. So what if they sent their drones over to spy on us? I mean, that would be a surefire way for the US to say, OK, we're at war now with Iran. But yet the United States is doing this everywhere. Well, we shouldn't expect that it's not going to come back to haunt us, because there is a proliferation of drones right now where it's estimated that over 50 countries have drones, most of them used for surveillance right now, but very simple to change a drone from surveillance and strap, strap on some missiles and have lethal drones. Um, the uh, only reason that the United States hasn't sold more drones overseas is that there are still some restrictions about who the drone manufacturers can sell to. And uh, the only reason that our airspace is not crowded with drones right now is that there have been some restrictions on using drones here in the United States. Well, the drone manufacturers understood that they needed a strong lobby, and they got together and created an association that sent its lobbyists to Capitol Hill and bought a bunch of Congress people. And when you buy Congress people, it seems they create a caucus for you in Congress, a congressional, congressional drone caucus, which has 50 members on it. And that drone caucus, together with the Drone Association, together with the Pentagon, wrote new legislation uh, to push for more drones to be uh, available here in the United States. Well. The Federal Aviation Administration is the one that regulates the drones in the United States. And they haven't opened it up totally because they're concerned about safety issues. First of all, these drones crash all the time. You know, they say, oh, they're real cheap, these drones. Well, you know, they're not real cheap, but cheap when they keep crashing and you keep having to buy newer uh, versions of it. But um, it's also hard to figure out how a drone is going to, without uh, someone in the cockpit, be able to really tell what's going on in the airspace around them. And so the FAA has been somewhat cautious. Now, they have refused to publicly disclose how many permits they have given out and to whom they've given them out. So a wonderful organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation sued the FAA and said, we demand as the public to have the right to know who has permits. Well, just this week, they got some of the results of that. And it turns out that there have been uh, between, they won't tell exactly, they say uh, between 700 and 750 permits given out since 2006. Some of them have been given out to the companies that produce the drones and want to test them here, like General Atomics and Raytheon Honeywell. Some of them went to, uh, a lot of them went to universities. And this is one area where I think we can work a lot with students um, because now we have a list of many of these universities. Uh, on the list includes Cornell, um, includes the University of Colorado, Arizona, Connecticut, Florida, Michigan, North Dakota, Wisconsin, um, many, many universities. And I think there are a lot of student groups that would be interested in working with us to uh, have campaigns to stop their universities from taking money to do research for killer drones. Um, the other went to 
uh, government agencies, national agencies, the FBI, the military, Homeland Security, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol are already using uh, drones along the southern and northern uh, borders, and the other uh, is the police departments. And now we know a little bit more um, that the police departments range from small towns, north of Little Rock, Arkansas, Arlington, Texas, uh, Ogden, Utah, Gadsden, Alabama, to Seattle, Miami, Houston. And they are getting money from us, the taxpayers, through Homeland Security to test out these drones. And on these tests, they say, um, of course, they try to uh, reassure us that these are only going to be used uh, against the bad guys, not against us in the peace movement, not for spying on us. Uh, but I wouldn't be so sure about that. Um, in Houston, the manufacturers talked about uh, giving the Houston um, Police Department a unmanned 50-pound helicopter decked out with powerful zoom camera and infrared equipment and uh, he said the drone is designed to be weaponized and could in the future be outfitted with what, what, what we call less lethal systems. Those include tasers that can electrocute suspects on the ground, uh, beanbag firing guns called stun batons. But he said, don't worry. Of course, uh, the ACLU is very worried, says this is getting us closer and closer to a surveillance society where every move is tracked, monitored, recorded, scrutinized and predicted that all the pieces appear to be lining up for the eventual introduction of routine aerial surveillance in American life, a development that would profoundly change the character of public life in the United States. Now, that was all written before February 14th. And February 14th was when the legislation pushed through Congress and signed by President Obama on Valentine's Day as a gift to the drone manufacturers is going to force the FAA to open up the airspace to drones by the year 2015 and speeding it up for government agencies before that. So we are going to see very shortly um, a lot of drones right here in the United States. And um, that gets me to something that a, a couple of you saw uh, last week when there was a drone fair in Congress. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty disgusting when drones are glorified in our nation's capital. And when you have uh, models like this that have the Hellfire missiles strapped to them in the foyer of the beautiful Rayburn building, and you have come, people who can come in to have a free lunch and be able to admire the drones and get all the literature that they hand out about how fantastic these drones is, are and uh, read the, the mission statement of the Drone Caucus that talks about the need to rapidly develop and deploy more unmanned systems in support of ongoing civil, military, and law enforcement operations. And they have something for everyone. They had um, uh, little uh, drone toys for the kids. Oh my God. Oh my God. And in my pocket, they had for the ladies, I guess, little drone pins. And um, also, if you didn't want to wear a drone pin, you could get a tank. Um, so these were the little gifts that were being given out. And um, we were disgusted, so uh, my colleague and I decided that we would get up and do a little mic check. So let's do the mic check right here. Sure. Pretend there's no mic. <laughs> mic check! Mic check! Mic check! Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. These drones, These drones are killing people. Are killing people. In Pakistan, Yemen, and elsewhere. In Pakistan, Yemen, and elsewhere. With a lot of passion, they violate international law. They violate international law. They make us less safe. They make us less safe. Shame on Congress. Shame on Congress. For glorifying these weapons. For glorifying these weapons. Shame on Congress. Shame on Congress. For taking money. For taking money. From the drone manufacturers. 
from the drone manufacturers. Let's use our money. Let's use our money. For health care, housing, and education. For health care, housing, and education. Not for remote control killing. Not for remote control killing. Well, here we got to finish it. In the halls of Congress, it was too scary for them to listen to, and they had to call in the police. And for two of us, with our little voices, they called in 12 policemen to tell us we could not disturb the peace by uh, making our voices heard there. But, um, well, I need you, and I am so glad for what you are doing tomorrow, and that brings me to the part of resistance. And the last two chapters of the book I wrote, you know, it was pretty depressing writing this book until I got to the last two chapters. And the last two chapters is about resistance. And it starts out with the, uh, the Creech and the Hancock resistors. So, And talks about people who are recognizing that uh, they are living in war zones because they are living in places that are uh, operating these drones and that they don't like um, their communities being part of that. And it talks about people going to the headquarters of the drone manufacturers. And it talks about people going to the homes of the CEOs of the drone manufacturers. And it talks about the legal community that has been slowly rising up and challenging these ridiculous legal justifications given for the drone program. And it talks about the human rights community that is saying, we need a government that is accountable and transparent. Here, under the eight years of, the, of, of Bush, we railed against torture and extraordinary rendition and indefinite detentions in Guantanamo. And then the constitutional lawyer, Barack Obama, gets elected and they recognize we don't have to be, put people in Guantanamo, we can just kill them. And it's so much easier. And it's hidden from view. And no dead bodies tell any tales. And so the, the human rights community is finally rising up and saying, this is not right. Finally, we're hearing the voices of Human Rights Watch and, 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 and Amnesty, and we have to echo those voices. And we are also hearing another voice from another community, which I find extremely interesting, and that's the scientific community. Because some of them are watching in horror as this development is taking place. And they recognize that this is just the beginning. They call it the early stages of these automated weapons. Uh, they liken it to the time of the Wright brothers for the development of the airplane. And they say, you ain't seen nothing yet. And if you only knew what is in production and how they are trying to have drones that are totally automated, that don't need any kind of pilot, that will be pre-programmed, and then just go out there and kill. And so they are putting together a group internationally that is trying to get an international convention to stop the use of lethal autonomy, autonomous drones before they are even being used. So we have a number of different pieces of our community. Uh, then there's the community that's concerned about privacy rights in the United States. And I hate to recognize it, but it's true and unfortunate that we can get a lot more support around these drones when we talk about the issue of privacy here in the United States. You know, we, we um, have a, a summit that's coming up next week and we, we uh, are working with a PR firm. And she called me up and she said, you know, Medea, I'm trying to get the media interested in talking to the drone victims and the lawyers and the people of Pakistan and Yemen and everything, and they're just not really interested. But when I tell them about drones coming to the United States, then all of a sudden they perk up. And that's true, and we have to recognize it. And we have to recognize also that it allows us to speak to a much broader swath of the American public, including people that consider themselves libertarians, uh, that consider themselves uh, conservatives, but don't like the idea of having the government spying on us even, even more so than we are uh, today. So I think there is a real possibility of having a broad coalition come together um, to fight against what can be seen as one, the killer drones and the spy drones, whether it's at home or abroad, 
is part of an undemocratic system, a secretive system, and we are fighting for a democratic system, an open and transparent system. And so I want to um, close by opening this up to the, the broader issues of, of the war itself. And um, while I say that it's great to broaden out to work with a community that um, cares more about the spine than they do about killing innocent people overseas, um, we have to reach out to spiritual community, faith-based community, to the youth in our community, to people in the Occupy movement who don't quite get how a society based on militarism is so bad for us in so many ways. The moral issues of killing people overseas comes back to haunt us with the killing and the violence that we see here at home. The racism that is part and parcel of turning young men and women into killers overseas, you really have to teach people that other people overseas are not as human as you are in order for them to kill them, or to even be sitting in a place in Hancock or Creech and press a button. Um, they call those people that they, they kill, they call it bug splat, because they say that's what they see on the screen. Um, that is part of a racist view of the world. A militarist society also is a sexist society. I mean, look at the rampant rape and abuse of women in the military. That comes back to haunt us here at home. And of course, uh, the uh, justification for taking away our civil liberties is part of a continued militarized society. And then the fact that we will never have uh, the money we need for all of the things that we need in our own society if we keep spending trillions and trillions of dollars not only on war but on hundreds of bases, over 800 bases overseas that shouldn't, we shouldn't have, we should close all of those military bases. We don't need them and people overseas don't want us there. And we would be so much safer at home. And so as we are working in our, uh, our, our efforts around the drones, um, let's not forget that there is an effort underway to get us in yet another war and that is in Iran. And um, I know that you had a session on that today, and I thank Layla so much for her work on this. Uh, and Layla, every time she talks, I think, um, talks about love. And it really is beautiful because those of us who had had the chance to been to Iran, and I had the chance to go with Layla, um, we see such a loving, open, wonderful, uh, hospitable society. And um, sometimes it seems corny to talk about love, uh, but we're really lacking um, in our movement when we don't talk about the need uh, to love our other, other people. And while the, there are elements of our society that are pushing for war, um, there are elements of our society that were very unhappy that the peace talks even took place recently tried to stop them from taking place and after they took place and there were some positive developments and there's another date set in May for a further round of talks uh, there are members of our government like Senator Joseph Lieberman who are very upset that the talks seem to go well <laughs> and uh, a group that is very influential in the US government called APAC uh, mm -hmm. that has been pushing a policy uh, in Alec, the United you? States that... Alec? Hmm? Alec? No, APAC, okay. which is the American-Israel Public yeah. Action yeah, Committee so. that has been pushing a terrible policy in the U.S. around Israel-Palestine, has also been gunning for war in Iran. And somebody was sending around a video that they did today uh, that just uh, was horrible. It talked about the peace talks in a very skeptical way. Um, they didn't want the peace talks to happen. They really just want to see a military intervention in Iran. But they said the only reason the peace talks uh, might have happened now is because of the crushing sanctions 
that we are imposing on the Iranian people. And uh, there's a, a young woman who was doing the video, and she spoke with great enthusiasm about how we are destroying the Iranian economy, how their uh, inflation has skyrocketed, how unemployment is just skyrocketing. And she was just so delighted about that. And I think about the women, the children, the men, the families um, that are being crushed with these crippling sanctions. And I think, how can we as a public allow this to happen again? We saw what happened in Iraq. We saw a Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who said that it was worth the deaths of 500,000 Iraqi children to impose those sanctions. And here, with another woman as Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, today, we are allowing that same kind of policy to go forth and think that it is so wonderful that we are destroying the lives of ordinary Iranians because somehow that's going to make them rise up against their government. And so while we go out doing this work, whether it's about drones, stopping the wars that we're already in, we must do everything in our power to stop us from getting in yet another war and destroying the beautiful society, the beautiful people of Iran. by saying that we're in a moment in our history where we have an Occupy movement that really has taken its enthusiasm from an Arab movement, from the Arab Spring that saw people just rising up and overthrowing their own governments, uh, taking its inspiration from uh, people in Europe who are rising up, taking its inspiration from the people in Madison, seeing how we can come together and call for major transformations in the way our society works, in the way our wealth is distributed internally. But let's make sure as we build the Occupy movement, we are also building a movement that is totally transforming the way that we relate to people around the world, that when we are trying to build a society here that is not for the 1%, but for the 99%, that means we don't want to build a society where the 1% of military manufacturers and contractors are making billions of dollars off of killing people. We want to build a society where our moral values of love and compassion are what we show to the rest of the world. We want to build a society that stops the useless, senseless, crazy violence internally in this country, but stops the violence that we are perpetrating overseas. So I want to end just by thanking you for your work, wishing you great, uh, uh, a wonderful day tomorrow. Know that what you are doing is inspiring people around this country, that the words and the videos that we will see tomorrow will also inspire people around the world and will show them that indeed we are part of a global movement for peace, justice, and democracy. Thank you so much.